Hey, uh, so we're going to talk now about uh, global energy consumption and where the world's energy resources are distributed. Something that you got to know for the test. And uh, it's pretty important in, in terms of understanding geopolitics uh, and how they play out in your lifetime. So the first thing to keep in mind is that the world consumes a lot of energy at this point, and it's been growing over time. So if you look at all the forms and use of energy, the sort of the global total is about 150,000 terawatt hours of energy per year. That's a lot, okay? Uh, and the vast majority of this is in the developed countries of the world. So you see that you've got the United States, you got China taking up the lion's share, uh, you've got Russia, India taking up a lot of the rest of it. Uh, but then you've got the, the undeveloped or the underdeveloped countries uh, not really, you know, contributing that much to it yet. So if we look at world electricity production, basically that's the main thing we're using energy for. We see that that uh, uh, China is the big player, uh, followed by the United States and India. And and yes, they do want you to know this. So, it's just, so you should know that China right now is, and that's easy to understand, is the, the big consumer of coal because that's how you produce electricity for the most part. And the United States uh, uses about half as much, but it's still the second biggest player. And if you notice, like South Korea comes down here seventh on the list, which is pretty interesting considering that that the uh, you know the population of Korea uh, is certainly not the seventh largest population in the world by a long shot, and yet you know we use a lot of the world's electricity. Now, so an interesting trend that you should be aware of is that as countries develop, they tend to use more and more uh, electricity and other energy resources. So if we look at back in 1990, we see that overall Asia at the time wasn't using that much. It was right about then that China was really starting to, to flex its muscles. And we see is, and South Korea as well, and we see is, uh, I guess, and India too. Okay, so, so basically between 1990 and now, most parts of the world, whether it's North America, Latin America, or most parts of the world haven't changed much. But the big change has been Asia. And that's because Asian countries generally went from being underdeveloped to fully developed economies. And in doing so, they need to you know, build infrastructure and hook up people with electricity. People need to commute, so they need cars. And so it shouldn't be surprising that as that happens, you end up with a lot more energy consumption, especially when you have large populations. Now, it is certainly worth noting uh, that one of the big problems we face as a civilization and as a, really as a species is that that the vast majority, trying eighty four percent of the energy that is consumed on this planet is coming to us courtesy of fossil fuels. Fossil fuels make all the air quality problems, and they lead to global warming, which we'll study in a later unit. So, so the fact that we're so reliant on fossil fuels is something that should scare us all and should motivate us to try to find a way out of this. And just look at this graph here. This is, I mean, our world in data is a pretty, pretty powerful website. And if you just look at what we find is traditional biomass, that's like in, in underdeveloped countries, we're talking people use like wood to, to heat their homes and cook their food, right? But if we look what's happened since 1990 and now, the consumption of coal, oil, and natural gas has soared, where most of the other things have barely made a change. I mean, they, they, yes, they have in, in, increased over what they were before, but they still make such a tiny tiny drop in the energy bucket. It's all about fossil fuels at this point, and that needs to change. So, so the thing is, although renewable resources, and by renewable resources, we're talking about things that you can get more of. So, so fossil fuels are non-renewable. In other words, you use them, they're gone. You're not getting them back. Uh, but things like wind and uh, geothermal and solar, these things you should never run out of. So we consider this to be non-renewable, I'm sorry, renewable resources. And what we find is, though, uh, renewable resources are becoming more and more used, but they still just account for such a tiny amount of the overall amount of energy produced that, honestly, um, ah, we got such a long way to go, people. We really do. So fossil fuel is a classic example of the tragedy of the commons. And the reason is uh, we all profit and benefit from using fossil fuels. You know, I use you know, I heat my house, you heat yours, I drive a car, probably your family does too. Uh, and, and, and the consequence of all this is we dump carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and it's causing climate change, which is causing all kinds of problems all over the planet. But because we each contribute a little bit, but we all share in the, the overall problems, we tend to just keep doing it, right? We, we don't feel that, that strong motivation to stop it that we would if we, if we felt personally the pain of what we're causing. That's how we got here. 
Uh, and the bottom line is it's just cheaper to use fossil fuels than it is to use things like nuclear and wind and other things. And because it's cheaper, everybody worries about their wallet and they don't worry about the atmosphere. And so uh, and as long as we allow people to make the choice, they are going to choose cheap energy and damage the atmosphere because that's just how tragedy the common works. Because the only way we're going to reverse this, people, is to make people pay for the problems of you and I are impacting the atmosphere by using fossil fuels. We should have to pay a tax for that. If we paid a tax for that, we'd be like, wait, maybe I could spend my money in a different way and save some taxes and not do as much damage. So until people are made to pay for it, they're, they're, they're just going to continue to cause the problem. So basically, what you can do is you can impose carbon taxes and governments can subsidize research and development into non-carbon energy resources and what we call carbon sequestration, taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and putting it underground or in the deep ocean. So the last thing I want to do with this uh, presentation is we need to talk about well, who owns the world's resources. This is, again, something that, that you're expected to know on the desk because it has a big role to play in geopolitics and uh, you know, who's going to make the choices about where we go uh, with the world's energy future. So if we just look at coal, coal is one of the main ways that we produce electricity. OK, and if you look uh, basically who owns it all, well, the United States and Russia and China own more than half of the world's coal. So you should just know that United States, Russia, China, those are three pretty easy countries to remember. You know, they're, they're big players in, in making energy, uh, you know, in, in using energy and they're big players in producing coal. All right, now, oil is basically petroleum, so we use it for for uh, for mostly for vehicles, for uh, boats, for cars, for uh, airplanes. OK, so you might be surprised to learn that most of the world's oil is actually located in Venezuela. Now, Venezuela is not a very functional government at this point. It's sitting on a huge amount of oil, but it's a very dysfunctional government right now. But that can change in the future. But but they own most of the world, followed by Saudi Arabia, just one country in the Middle East has 16 percent of the world's oil reserves so between these two you know we're talking close to 40 percent of the oil is owned by two fairly small countries um, now canada has a, a fairly significant amount and the problem with canada is theirs is not liquid oil so much it's what's called tar sands and 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 extracting oil from tar sands is, is incredibly environmentally damaging as we'll see uh, and then you have a lot of Middle Eastern countries like Iran, Iraq, Kuwait, the UAE. Uh, those are the other major players. So you got the Middle East, but then keep in mind you got you got Venezuela and Canada are the two other big players. Natural gas, natural gas is is basically formed the same way that that oil is, uh, but it, it tends to not always be accumulated in the same places that oil is accumulated. Uh, and in this case, we see a different different um, countries that are, that that have the most of it. Now, for a long time, people didn't use uh, natural gas as a, a fuel. They just got rid of it, right? But now we realize it's very valuable. So what you'll see is Russia has the lion's share of the world. It's more than a quarter of it is owned by Russia. And a lot of the so geopolitics that's happening with Russia and other countries has to do with its ability to run pipelines through countries in order to export this resource and profit from it. Other countries that have a lot of it are Iran, Qatar, and Saudi, which again, these are the Middle Eastern countries. So they, they kind of have a lock on the the oil and gas for the most part. And now uranium, you know, uranium is one of those things that I'm going to advocate. We really need to put a lot of investment into. I think it's, it's, it's a great solution to our energy problems. But if we look, what's kind of strange, like who owns most of the world? A quarter of it is in Kazakhstan, which is, you know, no longer a, 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 a Soviet controlled entity. It's its own country, but again, it's not fairly well developed. But Kazakhstan and Canada have by far the vast majority of the world's uranium reserves. Okay, so you are expected to know there are questions. I'm sorry, they're going to ask you, like, who owns most of the world's uranium? Who owns what, most of the world's coal and so on? And so uh, before we get to the test, I think it's going to be important that you, you just take some time to memorize these things. Sorry. Okay, see you guys.